This is Adam Gorney, Rivals.com with the Respect My Decision podcast. Here with former number one athlete, five-star player in the 2006 class, but onto bigger and better things in his life right now, Dr. Myron Roll. His book comes out today. Here it is right here, The 2% Way. Go out and get it. Bookstores everywhere, Amazon. Um, and it's a great read. I, 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 read, I read it already, Myron. It's incredible for, I think, college football fans, for people trying to develop themselves in life. Um, in business and in, in, in really everything. And, and so for people who haven't gotten it yet, describe for me what the 2% way means to you, this idea of kind of incremental improvement in your life and in everything you do. Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me. You know, this uh, mindset came from my coach at Florida State University, Mickey Andrews, my defense coordinator. Uh, he challenged me and all of our uh, players on the team to get 2% better every day in practice, 2% better in our stamina, our ability to tackle, our ability to high point the football, whatever the case may be. It was a real life tangible goal of daily improvement that he sought from us. And I extrapolated that sort of mindset to life. And so any chance encounter I had, any book I read, any experience I had, I was trying to extract 2% from that moment apply it to my own journey and break down a seemingly larger task. See, sometimes we have these goals and last month from now, a year from now, we can see the improvement. And I've used that in my life as a Rhodes Scholar and now as a neurosurgeon. And uh, we're hopeful that this book can help inspire some people too. I think that's really important because let's, let's talk about football players who are kids. They have goals in life. They want to either play in the NFL or go to college or do those things. And they see them as unattainable at some point because there's just so much of a path ahead. But just the, the the small improvement bit by bit, getting better day by day. And in, and in the book, you talk about it a lot, really in almost everything you've done since learning this from Mickey Andrews. Um, how has it helped you just make it easier to, to get to that final goal by just chipping away in small pieces? You know, it, it helped me stay focused. It helped me stay laser locked in into the goal and it reduced the background noise. It reduced the distractions that were around. It reduced the people who are next to me who may have seemed like they were getting it all yesterday or they were getting it all next week or they're getting it all right now. And it's like, well, why can't I do that? I keep comparing myself to someone else. No, that's not my case. That's not my path. That's not my journey. So let me stay focused on what I'm doing. Stay locked in. Enjoy those small victories. Allow my limbic lobe and my brain to release these neurotransmitters and say, you know what? It's a reward that I was able to do something well today. And I got better today. And I was better today than I was yesterday. And I, in football especially, I mean, when I played at Florida State, you know, I had some challenges on the field, especially catching, you know, the ball and tracking the ball, especially down in the in the deep halves. And I would spend time after practice working with my quarterback, EJ Manuel, working with my DB coach, uh, specific DB coach, Terrell Buckley and others, you know, going over game plans and trying to figure things out, putting it together 2% at a time. So that uh, weakness in my game became my strength. And it, it was a small steps every day uh, to improving myself. And I seen it work on the football field. I've seen it work now in medicine. I've seen it work in my personal life too. And so that's why we wanted to write this down into some paper and put it uh, in a book for people to enjoy and consume. You tell a lot of great football stories in this book, like the time that you went to Oklahoma as a freshman and met Bob Stoops. What was that experience like? And then were they ever really considered in your recruitment? Or like you say in the book, once you got to Florida State, you sort of knew that that was going to be the place for you. Yeah, you know, I think Coach Stoops, I, I thank him all the time. I still have a relationship with him, actually. I call him, uh, I text him, we talk quite often. And he often remarks, like, Myron Roll is the only recruit that after he didn't come, he still called me. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I just, I really enjoy my time with him. He's a phenomenal person. And so I thank Oklahoma. I thank Jeremy Crabtree. I thank Rivals for putting me on the scene when I went to that camp because I came out of nowhere and really had no understanding about recruitment or whatever that wa was, even though. My cousin Samari played in the NFL, Antrell played in the NFL. You know, their recruitment was a little bit different. And so walking into this new age where you have a lot of cameras on you, spotlight on you, go to these camps where you're going against some of the best players in the world um, at their position. And, uh, and so it was fascinating. I did think heavily about Oklahoma. David Bourne, uh, the president there, was a Rhodes Scholar. I mean, I just enjoyed it. Met Barry Switzer on my visit as well. It was a great place. Derek Strait, Roy Williams, wonderful players. Uh, but I thought Florida State was the right fit for me in the fact that the coach, Bobby Bowden, was a Christian like me. Uh, he had that grandfather-like figure. My parents didn't think that he was going to leave in my four years. He wasn't going to bolt to the NFL. He would okay. be there for me and with me. And he was committed to seeing me be a true student athlete, student uh, with, with the focus on student before athlete. It was great. They also 
rolled out the red carpet. I mean, the president of the university injures himself and still finds a way to to contact you. The governor of the state uh, is involved in this recruitment. And then Bobby Bowden, who just seems to fit exactly what you're looking for. And then Mickey Andrews and, and all of those kinds of things. When you're getting recruited, and, and especially from the Northeast where football isn't complete life, um, uh, what was it like to be in Tallahassee to, to experience those things, to get messages from Jeb Bush and those things? It, it was phenomenal. I, I mean, I remember walking into uh, the cafeteria where I saw Lorenzo Booker, Ernie Sims, Chris Ricks, and they were playing, uh, you know, the song, Everybody Get Your Roll On, Everybody, Everybody Get Your Roll On. And I'm like, oh, that's my last name. It's, it's phenomenal. Like, they're really paying attention. And it was just great. It was great to see that. Sit next to Coach Bowden, sit next to our president, TK Weatherall, who had just experienced a concussion earlier that day and still wanted to make it to the meeting. And then Jeb Bush texting and saying, you know, I should come to FSU. It was just wonderful uh, to feel that kind of love, uh, to know that people were supporting my journey, not only as a as an athlete, but as a student as well. And Florida State was committed to seeing me be a great player. Here's the honest truth, Adam. The honest truth was that, you know, if I went to Stanford or Michigan or Notre Dame or Duke, I'd be another smart football player. But if I went to Florida State, I'd be like the student athlete, like the football player who they can really mobilize their resources behind. Uh, and they did that. As soon as I got there, road scholarship. They wanted me to apply for a Fulbright. They got me in front of boosters. I was touring with Jeb Bush. I was touring with Charlie Crist. I was walking around lawmakers in Tallahassee. I was on commercials. I was on billboards. You know, they really wanted to highlight me. And I gave something back to the university and trying to be a good role model for students. And they gave something to me in the sense of providing me with the landscape to pursue my dreams as a road scholar and eventually as a neurosurgeon and also as an NFL player too. You go through that, have a tremendous career at Florida State. Then there's a decision to make. You choose Road Scholar, and 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 obviously it it turned out incredibly well. But through that, there was were some challenges. And and as the NFL became a challenge for you, and you know f- you know fairly or unfairly treated in that way, I, th- I I took this from the book, and I thought it was very interesting. You said in my lowest moments, I regretted taking the Road Scholarship, and and I think that might be someone in their early twenties with NFL dreams kind of thinking but now looking back what was that experience like taking the road scholarship and experiencing all you did in england absolutely you know i i put my name into uh the sort of scouting service uh as an underclassman to see where i'd get picked up i graduated fsu in two and a half years and they said i'd come back as maybe a first round pick early second i called up samari i said what are the ravens saying what's your team saying up there in baltimore Hey, you'd be a late first if you run fast, maybe early second. And Trill in New York, same thing, maybe second round guy. So, you know, these are good numbers. These are, it's a good position to be in. But the Rhodes Scholarship said you either take this scholarship now and come to Oxford or you don't get it. And so I had to make the difficult choice by saying no to the NFL and going over to England, getting my master's in medical anthropology, looking at the social and culture aspects of medicine and how people find their healing process through their culture culture through their stigmatizations, gender roles, post-colonial things, uh, and sort of helped me be a better pa- uh, a, a patient-centered provider uh, whenever I became a neurosurgeon later in life. Coming back to the NFL, getting drafted a lot later, only sticking around for three years, only making 50000 guaranteed signing bonus, definitely was a sacrifice. But, you know, looking back on it now, seeing how many people have drawn inspiration from that story, parents who've come up to me and my wife and say, you know what? I use your story as um, as an example to my son or my daughter uh, for what they can achieve being a student, being an athlete and, and choosing education over sports. Uh, that that really makes it worth the while and, and gives me um, solace that I made the right choice then. Yeah. And and the NFL was certainly an intention. I mean, you had your brother over in Europe training with you and, and those kinds of things coming back. And and you discuss this openly in the book. Um, may, the, the 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 idea that a lot of people maybe in pro football d- don't necessarily want someone who's focused on, you know, a future as being a doctor or, you know, and those kinds of things, whether it was in Tennessee or, you know, Pittsburgh gave you a shot and it just didn't work out. Do you still feel that sense years on from now that they want guys that are going to be solely focused on only this and and feel like, someone like you who has done this might not be as dedicated to football as they deem necessary. No question. Unequivocally. I, I was either at the top or near the top of my class, every station of my football career, pop Warner high school, you just mentioned top athlete 
um, college All-American, multiple years, ACC Defensive Rookie of the Year. I mean, always at the top or near the top. And then I get to the NFL, and then it's a precipitous drop-off. And I'm thinking to myself, well, did I just get worse in a year? I mean, I know I ate some bangers and mash and fish and chips over there in England, but I don't think my talent depreciated that much. And so, and then I talked to coaches, and actually, frankly, one of my linebacker coaches in Tennessee stopped me and said, Dave McGinnis, his name is, he said, Myron, I've been coaching football longer than you've been alive, son. You can play in this league for eight or 10 years. You have that talent. And and other coaches were telling me the same thing. And I'm like, wow, well, why am I not sticking? Why am I trying to shake this stigma? Well, part of it was, as I mentioned, you know, and as you mentioned very clearly, uh, that this, you know, this idea that I had other options that if I, something went awry in my football career that I can just leave and investing money, investing a draft pick, investing a starting position in me was a little bit too much because they may have to scramble to find someone to replace me because I have all these other options as opposed, juxtaposed to somebody who just has football. That's all they want. That's all they care about. They'll run through the wall because they don't care about anything else. These players are a little bit more malleable and easier to control and they'll do what you say. If you say, whoa, they'll say, whoa, if you say sick them, they'll go and they'll sick them. So that's the sort of mindset that I think existed then. I think it continues to exist now. I remember when I got released from the Steelers, one of the things that uh, their front office personnel said, well, you're playing so well. You have a lot of good tape in the can. You're balling out there. I said, okay, well, why am I here now? And they said, well, there's a guy who's under you, may not be at your level yet, but he needs this. You don't. We're not worried about you. You can be president one day, senator. You can be a neurosurgeon. You're going to be okay. So I said, well, this is what I want right now. I'm 24, 25 years old. This is where my life is. But it was frustrating. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, we move forward. We use a 2% way to sort of move from that disappointment into medicine, into studying for the MCAT, into trying to start my next chapter of my life. And uh, it's been a blessing to uh, to have left the game uh, with a little bit of money so I could pay for medical school with my hands, you know, good and clean and no breaks so I can operate and no traumatic brain injury or so I can have any sort of cognitive d- delay uh, with how I think about cases and try to manage patients in the hospital. Really quickly, I'd like your take on some of the people that you've interacted with through all this over the years. Bill Clinton, Jesse Jackson, um, just some of some some amazing people that you've been able to interact with and, and maybe pick up some some pointers from along the way as you've dealt with global health things or road scholarship things or anything else. You know, I think one of the biggest things for me and one of the biggest uh, sort of advices I got was from one of my heroes, Dr. Ben Carson. He's the reason why I wanted to go into neurosurgery, pediatric neurosurgeon at Johns Hopkins, separated two twins from the occipital lobe, and both of them lived. Dr. Carson told me uh, at church with he and his wife uh, that I always needed to be kind to the lunch ladies and janitors because they're people too. And ever since then, I just kept my feet on the ground, stayed humble, and understood that, yes, I do want to become the best pediatric neurosurgeon in the world, but I also know that the people who are in the hospital who seem to be looked over or looked through, uh, I want to know them. I want to know their stories. I want to be friends with them as well because they matter just like anyone else. So I think that meeting with Dr. Carson uh, was very, very profound and something I'll never forget. One of the things in the book that I laughed at about neurosurgery and as you went into it, there was, a, there was an application that said, consider whether you would be happy in any other field of medicine. If the answer is yes, perhaps neurosurgery is not the specialty for you. That's just incredible and amazing and really probably telling about the dedication that you have to put in. Yes, absolutely. Neurosurgery is uh, super intense. Uh, it is. It, it, it reminds me a lot of football. You know, the idea of focus, the discipline, uh, communication, teamwork, preparation prior to a case. I mean, if you're going to someone's brain or someone's spine, you can leave them permanently disabled. You can kill them. You can leave them with a speech deficit. You can leave them with something uh, that could hurt them and harm their uh, the meaning of their life and, and sort of the functionality of their life. And so you want to go and be as careful as possible. I love the delicate surgeries that we do. And I love the opportunity to bring people back from the brink of death uh, and, and have them go on and reintegrate with their communities and their families and, and do the things they love to do. So it's definitely a blessing and God's been good. And uh, my training in football, my training as an athlete, I think has prepared me to be a better physician today. Last question, and I, and I think this is looking back, maybe impossible to answer, but if you chose football and didn't choose the academic path and, and, and didn't do the Rhodes Scholarship, do you think you would now regret that decision if you had a 10-year, 12-year NFL career and not been able to impact people in medicine the way that you have? Do, do you think as it played out, there might have been frustrations, but in the end, it really did kind of suit exactly what you should be doing in life? 
I do. I really do. I think if I, uh, you know, didn't choose academics, if I didn't go to a Rhodes Scholarship, if I didn't make friends with Aisha Saad and Shad White and then Abdul El Sayed and Dave Hilly from Perth, Australia, and, you know, study medical anthropology and go to Congo with President Bill Clinton because I was a Rhodes Scholar and he wrote me and said he was how proud he was of me. If I didn't do these things, I'm not sure if my, um, my, my mindset, my myopia would open up as much as it had. I don't think I'd be placed in a position of being a role model or a leader like I have. Uh, I think it's absolutely been a blessing. And it's something that I can't wait to speak to my children about. You know, they're only two years old, so they're very young. But as they get older, I can't wait to talk to them about some of the journeys their father has had. And hopefully that I can teach them some of the things that I learned uh, to help me be a better citizen, a better leader, uh, and a better human uh, to everyone. Great. That is Dr. Myron Roll. Uh, here is his book, The 2% Way, out in bookshelves today. So go get it. Uh, thanks again for joining me, doctor. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate that.